Hello, and thank you so much for being here. I'm Kristen Baldwin, and we are here with the incredibly talented Pamela Adlin. So thank you for being here. Thank you guys for coming. This is amazing. I saw you on Twitter. Yeah, that you were waiting to see the thing. I loved it. I was excited. So, um, you know, we have a lot to talk about, but I'd love to hear just a little bit about the genesis of the idea for the show. And when you first started thinking about wanting to do a show about this character who is loosely based on you and all of that. Yeah. Did you guys like that? Like, are you all vulnerable right now? <laughs> like, I can't. I showed that to my best friends. They were like, honey, I can't. <laughs> I can't look at you. I'm not your friend anymore. <laughs> I'm your fan. Like, they were so upset. Um, anyway, the genesis is... Um, uh, it's so weird. I just want to talk about the episode. But um, it was uh, hard for me to come up with a show for myself because I wasn't really... Uh, uh, it wasn't on my radar for me to write for myself. I was very... It was easy for me to come up with ideas for Louie and write on Louie because, like, that's a that's another person, you know? So, like, for me, it was, like, a, a different story. And so, you know, I've been acting my whole life, so I'm like, oh, here's the, the chance, you know, you, you get to have a show of your own, but it wasn't really on my radar to do that. Is that what you asked me? <laughs> I was too excited about the show. Well, I have a question about, uh, I have lots of questions about the episode as well, but um, so when you came to the, or when the opportunity came to you, how did you decide what you wanted the show about you, or for you to be? Um, you know, uh, of course I went to the place where it was like, you know, should I be a manicurist? Let's be something. <laughs> Totally not you. Um, you know, and then at the end of the day, I'm like, well, you write what you know, which is what my dad always taught me. And so, um, you know, my life, the bones of my life became uh, the structure of the show. But, you know, instead of running away from what I am, really, I just ran towards it. And then the stories started telling themselves. And, uh, you know, you've talked before about how, how, as a mom, you know, you are used to being in charge. You know what it means to make decisions and have to, you know, make things happen. But as a performer, were there any concerns or reservations that you had about being in charge of a show that you were also going to be performing in, given that it would kind of split your focus on what you would be doing on, a, on set? Um, you know, I never even thought about that. But when we were shooting, um, my first AD or like my script supervisor would come up to me and my first AD would say, I need to speak to the director, Pamela, now. <laughs> and then bat, bat, my script supervisor would be, I need to speak to the actor, Pamela, now. I'm like, and she would just point to the lines that I was forgetting. <laughs> and she would like take, take the script and go, did you want to say... <laughs> Or did you see? <laughs> and I'd be like, okay, I got it. But, um, you know, uh, it was kind of, you have to separate yourself because um, I'm watching the show, I'm, I'm choosing my frames as a director, and then I see myself and I'm like, oh, fuck my neck. <laughs> Jesus, this is not good. And then I would be like, I got to suck it up. You just got you just got to get through it. And so I had to separate myself from the lady that I was seeing, you know, on the screen in the frame when I'm in the editing room and I'm like, Ey. you know, I don't like that take for me, but everything else in the take is great. So you have to do it. You 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 know, there is um a vanity that you cannot have when you're, you know, uh, running the whole show and you're directing the show and everything. You just have to get rid of all of that. And it's like, oh, fuck, I see my roots. Okay. <laughs> in episode three, six, and nine, because we shot those all in the same block, I'm gray. I look like Dick Cheney. And then I was able to get my roots done between one, 
seven, and ten. <laughs> but that's just actory shit. I'm so excited to be at SAG. Talk to my <laughs> actors. My <laughs> actor community. <laughs> So when you're, you separate yourself, you know, from the woman who is on set acting, but when, when you are then that woman, how do you separate yourself as a performer from the director and that Pamela and just, you know, perform the way you want to without the stress on you? Well, you know, I, I, you, you, you always, you have to take a moment, you know, um, because I don't have like a creative partner on set with me. You know, I have my wonderful crew and the people around me, but I don't have, you know, somebody who's my second. I wrote this whole season with Louis C.K., but he's not there with me. And so there isn't somebody to go, okay, just take a minute, you know? So sometimes it's like we're shooting maybe uh, four different episodes a day, pieces of four different episodes in a day. We shot the whole season, 10 episodes in 40 days, all on location, cross-boarded. We would shoot 10 pages a day. And so sometimes I would be like, okay, what's the next scene? What the fuck just happened to me? What, what I don't even remember. What am I wearing? And then <clears throat> my DP and my first AD would be like, okay, we're going into grace. If we don't get this now and whatever, and I would get so wound up and I'm such a pleaser and I certainly want to have everybody home by a certain time, but I have to get my shots. I have to honor uh, the 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 entire culture of this uh, of this show and this community that I'm making uh, in my story. So I would just say, give me one second, and I would just walk around the corner where nobody's looking at me, nobody's touching me, none of that, and I would say. Okay, did I get everything I need? Did I get all my shots? You know, it's like you, you've got to take a minute. And it, if you do that, then you're going to save more time. It's not going to, it's not going to add time by you taking a breath and, and taking an account of what you have and where you need to be. That's not what you asked me. It is, though. It is what I asked you, and I'm that's an excellent, to... it's an excellent answer, so okay. thank you. Thank you. Um, so you've said before uh, that voiceover work was something that uh, saved your career at a certain point because you were having trouble, I guess, after uh, when you were, you were a child. After the facts of life? Yes. So can you, yes, <laughs> okay. after that. So can you talk a little bit about... Uh, After I robbed the dry cleaner on the Jeffersons? Yes. yes, yes. That was a big week. It was a big week. Of work. <laughs> I mean, I could talk about that episode too, but... Um, I mean, all day. All day. But about uh, voice work, what was it that appealed to you about it and uh, allowing you to brag a little bit? Why do you think you excel so well at it? Well, um, okay, so those are two different things. The, the, voice, the voice work, you know, saved me because I wasn't, I wasn't working. And, uh, you know, I'm a worker. I'm somebody who thrives on, on working. I feel bad if I don't have a job, if I'm not earning. So even though um, I was working a lot as, as a teenager in the 80s, then the work started drying up. And I became less of, you know what I mean? Like, I didn't fit anywhere, you know? So, like, my gender bendy oove time <laughs> came to a screeching halt in the 90s. And then it was like, I wasn't, like, really, like, a girl or a lady or whatever. So I was just, like, really kind of just not fitting in anywhere. And it's like... It, my agents would submit me for stuff, and then once in a while somebody would go, oh, I really like her. <laughs> She's so edgy and dark and, you know, all these things. So <clears throat> it, it was tough. So then I went on unemployment. I went to work in a flower shop. I remember my agent walking into the flower shop. I was working, and he goes, what are you doing here? And I was like, can I ask you? <laughs> The same fucking question? Yes, what am I doing here? 
my people. My people. So funny. Swear to God. So I had to, I had to keep going. So then I started doing radio. Um, I had done a commercial, which was just a weird, I don't know why. Somebody had put me in a commercial for Jack in the Box and it, William Fraker shot it, who like shot like Close Encounters. It was like this amazing thing. It, I don't remember why, but somebody thought it would be interesting to put me in this Jack in the Box commercial. And I coined this phrase. I said, do it with chicken. Okay, you're all gonna fucking Google that tonight. I don't care. <laughs> and so I'm like, uh, chicken feed. So I told those guys, do it with chicken. So like I said, this phrase, like Clara Peller, where's the beef? So I was the do it with chicken girl. And then the guy, <laughs> the guy who heard me on that commercial um, called me in to uh, do a voice. And he's still my agent today. His name's Paul Doherty with uh, CESD. And he had me read this copy for a 7-Eleven commercial. And he said, this is a, 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 a Kevin and his father. And they go, on. I'm like, I can't read that. And he said, no, you can. And I booked it. And that was my first campaign. And I did a, uh, that for years. And then I just did all this radio. And then um, I really wanted to get into animation. And I couldn't get arrested in animation. I, I could get all these radio jobs. And then one day, like I booked an animation thing and then another, and then I couldn't get arrested in radio. It was like one or the other, yeah. you know? But I think in terms of voiceover, sometimes it's not about your ability as, uh, you know, like all the voices that you can do. It's about your ear. You have to be able to hear you, you have to have a keen ear. And uh, one of the things that is so uh, unique about the show is that it really does show an aspect of um, the actor's life as just a working actor. There are some gigs where Sam's really excited, and there are some gigs where she's just clocking in and clocking out, and you never really see that. It's always so glamorized, you know, when people are actors in, in fictional shows. So I'm interested in what interested you about showing that side of the business and your experience. Well, it... You know, because I'm a working actor, you know, I consider myself a journeyman working actor. I've been working hard, like literally my whole life. So I don't have a glamorous life. I don't, you know, I mean, I'm sitting here today talking to you about my show. This is very different. You know, I don't, uh, you know, I, I go home, I go, if you're lucky enough to get a job, you're sitting there, you're working on a fratter day, your Friday turns into Saturday, your blood's going cold, you're like, don't any of these people have fucking family or kids? And you're like, never gonna go home again. And, you know, and then your scene gets cut. <laughs> also, I was an elf, but I got cut. So, what's the most? Uh, what's your? What's big, the most I've gotten cut? No, the, out of like the most painful thing you've gotten cut from, or the thing you're proudest of of getting cut from. Um, oh, <laughs> I have something that I wish. Okay, We're uh, in, a safe space. in the future, I know safe space. I I I don't even. There's so many. I mean, Just I've pick done. One. Pick one that we wouldn't know that you that were in. I'm. I've, we're in, and you were cut from. I was in. I was in Alf. They fucking cut me. <laughs> I was in Space Camp. They cut. So some lady today at AOL built. She came up to me and she was like, "Space Camp." I was like, "What <laughs> the fuck?" She because literally in Space Camp, I had to go back home and I couldn't finish shooting the movie. So you watch me watch the rocket take off, and then my name's in the credits. But that's the whole. <laughs> thing and I was so excited to be in the movie for like one second but I didn't get to go to Texas so anyway. so anyway I derailed you but the the experience of being a working actor that was something that interested you in portraying yeah I wanted to show the mundane you know it's just like it's like you punch a time card you know what I mean like you know it's like whether you're an actor or your background or anything that's that's what you do you know, it's a very real thing. I had a woman 
in a scene in season one and I, I basically, I pull her out of a cab while I'm on the phone and the whole scene got cut. But while we were shooting, I was like, you're so familiar to me. And she's like, oh no, no. And I'm like, yeah, dude, I know you. And she's like, I don't know, no. She was in my pilot. Okay, so my my ex my background casting guy had put her in the pilot, and he was recycling all the people. Who, and I always feature my background prominently in my show. And I was like, that bitch was the mother of the triplets in the big box <laughs> store when I said, "Can anybody help me?" And she was like, "No, I've never met you before." <laughs> Amazing. It's not what you asked me. It doesn't matter. <laughs> so uh, you have some wonderful uh, young performers on your show who play your daughters. They're fantastic. And being someone who has been working, you know, you started working when you were young. Um, how does that change or does it affect how you interact with them and how you direct them having, you know, been a young actor yourself? Well, you know, there's, there's a few things, of course, but I, I relate to them more as a mother now. So, um, you know, all of that stuff, it, it, you know, but they come in and it's like, I can see that one of them's flatlining. I'm like, take it away, feed it, give it food, <laughs> put it in a dark room. Um, you know, and, and other time, you know, I'll say, give me the cell phone. Give me the cell phone. I'm your mommy now. Give me the cell phone. <laughs> you know, so they're at different levels developmentally and whatever they have brought to the table professionally. So I always uh, take that in. You know, Hannah, who plays Frankie, my middle daughter, she lives in the Bible Belt, you know. So it was a massive learning curve for her, uh, especially in the first season in particular, um, and, you know, they come from a very small community, and so to be able to have these girls and their families, their parents, trust me, you know, I had to, I had to create this place that they could trust me, and if they weren't able to get to a place emotionally or get into a scene, I would say, you don't have to worry. We're not going to stop until we get it. I know we're going to get it. So, um, you know, that's the way it is. I mean, uh, we would be doing stuff and I would be sweating my balls off because I would be like, you know, no, you got to look at me, lock in, you know, because it's really hard. It's, it's, it's a discipline that even, uh, you know, we as adults don't have to be able to connect, not be afraid, to go off the rails, to suck, to all of those things. It's, it's, it's a, a huge thing. So, you know, when I'm doing stuff that's uh, particularly emotional with the girls, you know, um, like Mikey would say something to me, like, uh, tell me about your horrible life again. <laughs> because she's had an amazing life so far. And so it's like, she's just this new blossoming flower and she's literally a test tube baby and a homeschooled person. And she is like, lives a happy life. And I'm like, okay, let me tell you about my uncle again. <laughs> it was a really dark, yeah. So anyway, I mean, but that's, but that's how we would go there. We would just talk about lives and, and you know, they've, they've grown so much since the first season because, you know, I sent them away with a lot of tools. And it's like, keep it, you know, uh, remember it. Maybe we'll come back and do this again. And uh, Hannah in particular in this season just like floored me. And she came back and you'll see later on in the season what she does but I mean that kid just kills me she's like she's kind of like I I told her that she reminded me of Buster Keaton you know because she's just like a clown and she gets super uncomfortable and uh I would just say you know stay stay in your character you know if you if you mess up a line it's fine but if you kind of break character, I can't go anywhere with it. But if you stay there, and she listened, and she, I mean, 
She's just incredible. I can't really talk about her too much without bursting into tears because I ah. <laughs> hate feelings, really, is something you don't know about me. So, anyway. Bleh. Well, uh, I'm sorry because you hate feelings, but we're going to talk about the incredibly beautiful scene that we just watched at the end, the, uh, the dialogue-free scenes. There are so many beautiful, wonderful dialogue-free scenes in the show, including at the end of this past episode, where you're just seeing Sam and she's just, you know, thinking, absorbing, whatever's happening. And I'm interested both as a writer, how do, how do those scenes, are there, do you write anything in the script about, is it just Sam sits on the bench or is there something more deep to it? And then how do you approach it also as a performer? Um, you know, everything is very much scripted. Uh, actually, the only thing that is not scripted in this episode is w what, uh, when th the script ends with Sam watching her kids on the beach and then she finally closes her eyes. That's how it's scripted, that she's able to fall asleep and be at peace. And when I was cutting this, I showed Louis and he said, you got to put a frame back at the end where she's thinking about it. And the, then I did. And FX, who gives me like no notes, um, came back to me and said, uh, you know, John Langraff, who I love with all my heart, president of FX, he was like, I was a little deflated that you put that shot at the end, and I was like, oh, fuck. <laughs> and then my other uh, creative executive, Jonathan Frank at FX, he said, you know, I was, I, was, I was sad. I was a little disappointed. I was like, oh, shit. So then I called Louie, and I said, I want to deliver two endings. I want to give them the scripted ending and then the shot. He said, no. You have to make a decision. You have to make a decision. I was like, oh, fuck. So I decided to just keep it like this because I love, because you get to go on the journey with her twice. That's the way I feel. Because I feel like she's watching and you experience this whole, she gathers up her kids. She rents a Dodge Challenger. And... She gets her kids and she falls asleep and then you see her picturing it. You don't know that after it goes black, she doesn't get up and do it. So you get to live it twice. That's what, that's what I loved. So I don't know what you guys think about that since I told you both. You don't, don't. You know, I mean, but I told you both, but I, I don't know. You could think about it both ways. And when you're performing, you know, that, moment when she's sitting and you know there's she's not saying anything there she's not really reacting to anything but like how do you uh get into that space because there this isn't you know there there are things that happen like this on the show you know the the end of the first season she's just sitting yeah. on the stairs and it's a you know it's that moment holds for a minute and you really are watching her experience something even though she's not saying anything well i just think it's interesting to um you know to go into her head. I mean, this is the way I see my life. So I, you know, I'm fully engaged in my life. I, I'm, I'm, I'm with my kids every day and with my friends when I'm lucky enough to be with them and I'm working, but I'm observing everything. This is the way that I am seeing my life. So I'm just going into her. You know, I like to go and stay on other characters um, and maybe they're not even particularly ones that we want to know about. You know, like um, the father of the girls in season one, after he sits down and he has dinner with me, and he tells me he's not going to be around them, and I leave, and the camera stays on him. You know, that's interesting to me. It's like, I want to sit in the fart of his face <laughs> at that moment and not make any comment, you know what I mean? That's interesting to me. I mean, that's, that's what's working for me aesthetically, and that's what my network is so lovingly giving me and has come to understand for me about my show. And so that's one of the things that I'm able to execute. 
So as, you know, working actor and uh, now running your show, how does, when you are auditioning actors to be on the show, how does your experience of doing many auditions, you know, affect how you behave or how you respond uh, or even how you, you know, experience other actors as they come in and perform? Well, here's the thing, <laughs> because um, when we get a list of people and we went through this, um, with Gail Keller on Louie, she cast Louie, and Felicia Fasano cast my show. When you see offer only, we just go like this. Ugh. <laughs> because it's just really like, we're, we're just like, unless we're thinking pie in the sky, like, it has to be Clive Owen. You don't <laughs> understand. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you why. But, you know, it's like when you see... When you see offer only, it's just a huge bummer because it's like, I don't, I don't know. And it's, it's, there's so many levels to it. And it's like when people come in and read, it's a huge thing. It's like, I wouldn't want to, you know, uh, not, I wouldn't want to be offer only. I would want to come in and read for something and make sure that we all connect, you know what I mean? It's just the best possible thing you can do is audition, don't be above auditioning. And um, in terms of, uh, you know, the process, you know, Felicia like brings the actors in, but we would do like pre-production at this big giant, um, like disgusting, cool building from the 70s, the Sunkiss building in LA. And it's like, it's crazy because like every single show is in there. So my casting director's in there and then my office is in there. So I'm walking to my office and actors are outside my office and I'm like, hello. And they're, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, oh my God, you're in Orange is the New Black. That's so awkward. Hello. And so that's how I met Alicia Reiner because she was sitting in my waiting room waiting to read for my show. And that's how I met Greg Cromer, who plays Jeff, the fucking awesome, wonderful Greg Cromer. Um, he was sitting in the waiting room reading for the fucking tick. <laughs> and he was sitting there and I said, I saw you in, like he did a weird um, YouTube series with my friend Romy Rosemont and Mary Birdsong called like Party of Five or Bitter party of five or something and I was like you're in the thing with Romy and he was like he was like yeah I was like what are you reading for and he's like the tick <laughs> and he's kind of like dicky like that like he's in the and I was like you should read for my shit and so I came out and I had them bring the sides to him and so you know I mean this is what happened Lucy Davis came in to read for my show and I was in my office and Felicia came over and she said, I want you to come in and meet Lucy. I, I couldn't go and be in the room with everybody mm -hmm. because I'm such a Jewish mother. I would have written a fucking part for everybody and my show <laughs> never would have been on television. I never would have made any television. But um, it's, it's an amazing thing when the actors come in to read. The actor who's in this episode who's driving me to, in the golf cart. I met him at a vegan restaurant in Sherman Oaks, <laughs> eating by myself while my daughters were getting their nails done or some shit. And he was sitting with his wife and he was like, we love you in Californication. <laughs> and I was like, oh, thank you so much. And so they're sitting there talking and they were like, would you like to join us? And I was like, well, fuck yeah. And I went over and I sat and I ate with them and they told me all about their journey to try to have a baby through IVF and whatever. And then the next thing I know, he auditioned to play Alicia Reiner's new boyfriend oh. uh, in my show. So he auditioned to play Mark, the guy who says, welcome to Casa Sunny. Um, and he wasn't right for that. And I was like, I don't know. So I made him be the driver in the show. And we had this whole gorgeous scene, which I one day will make extras. And I said, 
Sanjay, tell me about when you and your wife were doing the IVF thing. Do you mind telling me on camera? He's like, no. And we have this whole thing of him driving and going, we're still together and everything. So it ends up, I cut it to, he drops me off and I go, have a good baby. <laughs> <laughs> That's what that moment is in my show. <laughs> Ooh, you need a Sherpa yeah. <laughs> to get to the end of my story. <laughs> Uh, in season one, <laughs> in season one, there's a scene where uh, Sam is in a, a film and she asks for a sex scene to be toned down because she is a little concerned about her daughter seeing her do something explicit on film. And I'm wondering what uh, moments in your career maybe have given you pause uh, for your children to see. That exact moment in Californication. Okay. <laughs> so that is just lifted directly out of my life and like... Uh, we got picked up and it was a new season of Californication and I'm reading the script and I'm like, do, 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 do. Oh, shit. <laughs> and I'm like, it's like my worst nightmare is like, you know, being having somebody go down on me, look at me, and then have somebody look at me while the person is. <laughs> and I'm like, now I have to do it on television. And I have a daughter in high school and a daughter in middle school and a daughter in elementary school. And I was like doing all the math. So I wrote to Tom Kapanos and I was like, hey buddy, can't wait for the new season. And he was like, yeah, go Marcy. And then I was like, hey, anyway, just a little tiny thing. And he said, oh, you mean the funny part. And so that totally is directly, <laughs> and I did it with like cheetah heels on legs in the air. <laughs> well, I guess after that, then nothing... My legs can, were still good then. I don't know. <laughs> nothing can stress you out after that. <laughs> yes, yeah. no. So uh, we have a time for a couple more questions. One of, uh, again, we're in a safe space, and uh, people always like to hear about what is your worst audition of all time? Uh, there was one where... I don't remember what the the show was for, but I had I had a scene that I auditioned and it was like in Century City in like a financial building. And the guy said, um, okay, now I want you to read this scene. And he gave me a scene. Basically, he wanted me to have an orgasm in front of him. Um, and I was like, he said... I uh, let's just do this scene. And I looked at the paper and it was just a woman having an orgasm. And I was like, yeah, I think we're all good here. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's, it, but probably it was a little more awkward than that. But, you know, um, there's been many times in my life that, you know, you just... I feel like, you know, as an actor, what I would say to you guys, the thing that I remember most is my best auditions. Um, I didn't get the part. Some of my best auditions, the way I felt, I was like, I fucking nailed that. That was amazing. And I didn't get the part. So just never, you know, give up or get down when that happens to you, just keep that with you because that's the work that you do. You know, nobody can take that away from you. Even if, you know, uh, somebody else gets the part, it doesn't mean anything. Well, that uh, is a good segue into our final question, which is what is the best advice you've ever been given about this industry, this business, or being a performer uh, just any time in your career? Well, I... <sighs> I don't know uh, that anybody has... A, 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 it wouldn't be advice like anything. I would just say, you know, just keep working on your life, you know? I mean, your life is going to make you deeper and better as an actor, you know? So I would put off going away or living my life for years because of fucking stupid pilot season or whatever, because like, maybe I'll get an episode of Jake and the Fat Man. <laughs> or some shit from back in the day. Like, who cares? You know, 
<clears throat> when I got pregnant with my first daughter, you know, I was already like 28 years old. I was like, oh my God, I'm in so much trouble because it's like, how can I do this? And I was like, well, when was I ever going to stop and say, now it's time for me to have a baby. Now it's time for me to go to Africa. Now it's time for me to, you know, go help hold crack babies or whatever. I feel like I'm being totally serious. Like you, you have to go do those things. You have to also invest in your life, you know, um, invest in your future. Um, it, you know, do things that m make you deeper, you know, uh, and enhance the world around you. You know, uh, if, you, if you just want to be a straight up actor, that's fantastic. But you also have to, you know, live your life, you know, and just just do more things. You know, there's no limit, you know, expand your ability to take on more. So that's the advice I would give. Well, that's excellent advice. <laughs> We'd like to thank Pamela Adlin for being here. Thank you so much for being here. And Better Things Season 2 is happening now on FX.